spent most of my career in higher education as a chemistry professor and researcher, and I worked uh, closely with regional businesses, and lately I transitioned into uh, economic development, working for Withers Ravenel, which is a civil and environmental engineering firm. Um, so I'd like to just take a couple mo moments to uh, manage traffic for the session. We have some smart people on this uh, in this meeting that know a whole lot more about these uh, projects and issues than I do. So uh, hopefully we'll have some good discussion. Um, so Paul, do you have a presentation from me or should I just share my screen? Uh, I have it for you. Can you see it? Yep. So that's uh, maybe the last page. Maybe. Yeah. Keep on going up to the second slide. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. So um, as you, I, I spent a little bit of time trying to get information, and there's a lot going on. So there's these are headlines from the uh, Citizen Times, there's free internet, free broadband, we have SpaceX. So a lot of interesting things going on. And I think I've learned even more in the last, I don't know, couple hours of listening to speakers and comments and reading the chat. So I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna briefly highlight a few things that are happening around the region. So next slide. All right, so here, here's, uh, here's one example. So back in 2018, the uh, US Department of Agriculture uh, awarded a few projects in Western North Carolina, which were projected to start in late 2019 and could take up to five years to finish. So uh, to my knowledge, these are still ongoing as far as I know. And um, if, if any of this information is needs to be nuanced or corrected, please feel free to do that. Um, this, uh, this project impacted Cherokee County and the recipient was Blue Ridge EMC. And they'll use uh, a $3 million grant with um, I think a $450,000 match to benefit 2000, over 2000 homes. And it, it impacts Cherokee County, which is our westernmost county and I think parts of uh, Georgia. Um, so next slide. Another USDA grant, um, similarly, it, it impacted, um, uh, I think this might be out of order. So Catawba County, Watauga, Ash, Avery, and Lincoln counties. Um, I think this is out of order. Anyway, I'll go to this one. Um, so this was a, um, from the USDA, it was uh, investing $42 million to help rural residents gain access to healthcare and educational opportunities. And this was a distance learning and telemedicine grant. Um, I found out about this just recently, I think last week. And so since rural areas are seeing uh, higher infection and death rates from COVID, um, including a, a different underlying conditions, um, this will address uh, some of those problems. So $24 million is being provided through the CARES Act. And then this investment is supposed to um, benefit 5 million rural residents. And so this project called the Partners Behavioral Health Management Project, um, it's a grant of $144,000 and it will be used to install telemedicine systems to provide remote mental health services at 13 rural sites in these counties. Um, and these counties have fewer mental health providers per capita 
compared to other areas of the state. And so, um, and five of these sites will be pediatric clinics. So next slide. So growing, okay. So the, uh, the growing rural economies with access to technology, the GREAT program um, has received a lot of news over the last couple of years. And so um, from, this story was from August of 2020 and uh, Governor Cooper, Cooper announced that the state will award more than $12 million in grants to expand high-speed internet in 11 rural North Carolina counties. And so in this round, the grants went to Zito Media in Graham County and then Skywave uh, in Swain County. And the grants are expected to connect uh, 8,000 families, 250 for businesses, farms, and community institutions. Next slide. So um, the rural, the FCC's Rural Development, Di Rural Digital Opportunity Fund has been mentioned uh, quite a bit today. So I won't spend a ton of time uh, talking about it, but this map uh, shows you Western North Carolina census blocks that are eligible for the uh, already hard off, however you pronounce it, funding. And the money um, from the FCC, it was about $20 billion. I think $16 billion goes to places with no broadband service at all. And then four, a little over $4 billion targets partially served areas. Um, and then the fund plans to prioritize bidders that can provide higher speeds, greater usage allowances, and lower latency. Um, and so in, um, in Western North Carolina, uh, as mentioned earlier, SpaceX, Starlink was uh, a big recipient, and then Charter Communications. Um, and so for Western North Carolina, I think it's $45 million going to Western counties and uh, there are 11 providers and cooperatives were awarded about $10 million. Um, the funds are expected to connect almost 7,000 households, 243 businesses, and so on. And if you want to break out of which county got what, I have that information, but I won't go over it now. Next slide. And then I think I think this will be the last thing I want to mention. So the ARC, Appalachian Regional Commission, uh, funded this partnership between the NC uh, Department of Information Technology, the Broadband Infrastructure Office, and then uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Rural Health um, uh, Branch. And so ARC awarded them $634,000 with a $97,000 match from Dogwood. And the purpose of this uh, project is, I think the first part is done or is getting done and there's a phase two. And so the purpose was to increase access to healthcare for vulnerable populations and disadvantaged, disadvantaged groups while simultaneously increasing the economic viability and digital skills for residents seeking to re-enter the workforce. So I think with that, I'll just stop there. Um, that's a little bit of overview from, you got USDA, you have FCC, ARC, you've got partnerships. Um, those are some of the highlights of what's going on in the region. Um, so, if you have questions uh, at this point, hopefully we have Mr. Jeff Searle, I think here we have Stacy Hughes, who I'm pretty sure is with Dogwood Health Trust. Um, we have a lot of folks who can answer these questions. So I will just, um, you know, mute myself or I don't know how we want to do this. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just start with a question, um, sure. maybe for for Jeff. A lot of the you know this conversation has been about funding for and affordability for uh, expanding access. Um, what can you say about um, programs at the state level that help um, affordability for for the consumer? Is there anything coming on that end? 
Yeah, there's no direct subsidy program that the state uh, runs similar to Lifeline at the federal level. But um, time and time again, we have submitted proposals to the governor's office for his budget, uh, some of which have been included and in also to the General Assembly around that issue. Um, one of the things we'd like to see is a state incentive uh, to, um, uh, for providers to provide uh, or accept the Lifeline program funding. So $9.25 a month, month. Um, uh, a, a number of broadband providers in the state do not take that funding uh, or do not accept lifeline supported customers. So we've uh, uh, looked at some policy around creating some tax incentives, um, which the state used to have to, to incentivize providers to accept the lifeline subsidy. We've also looked at and proposed in the past changes to the great grant program where in, um, the great grant program applications are scored on a matrix that is established in the statute. And one of the, the scoring criteria that we would like to see added is uh, points for uh, either affordability programs, uh, low cost service, acceptance of the lifeline subsidy uh, and so forth. Um, the, the other thing that I would mention is, um, and I think Dan had mentioned this earlier, but the $3.2 billion that Congress appropriated for the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. We have been working with the FCC and following closely um, as the FCC rolls out that program. We even submitted comments during the comment period. Um, the FCC issued an order last Friday laying out um, how it will uh, administer this program. So we are working on um, putting together some marketing and outreach materials that we hope to get to our stakeholders, including Land of Sky and Southwest Commission, to send out to their, um, to their constituencies. Um, and we'll try to use every uh, lever possible to make North Carolinians that are in need of this benefit program uh, aware of it. It's up to $50 a month for your broadband bill. And that will extend six months past the date when the uh, COVID uh, pandemic emergency declaration is lifted by the federal government. Um, but uh, a word of warning and, and something that we're concerned about is that uh, although 3.2 billion sounds like a lot of money, uh, the 3.2 billion is for the entire country. So uh, you'll have a lot of folks that, that will be vying for this benefit. And so uh, there have been some estimates that the benefit, if everyone who is available, well, I'm sorry, everyone who qualified for the benefit accepts a benefit, that uh, the benefit may only last about two months, two or three months. So um, that, that's of concern. And I think Congress, again, is looking at that issue in, uh, in some of the other uh, legislation that it's working on. So that, that covers, I think, in a, in a broadly, the, the various affordability programs that are available now. Right, hey. Paul, the, if I might, this is Dan. Um, sorry, Chris. Uh, go ahead. Just the... The follow on on that is that what happens is once the EBB, once something gets started, it gets easier to say, oh, look, why do we want to leave this hanging now? So it's possibly the federal government could consider the amount of money we need looking at the take up on it, consider the state could, this could give Jeff's uh, kind of points about state level uh, incentive more, more uh, heft, if you will, because people will get started and, and you'll see that they'll, they'll been hooked on to it, especially families with children. I think we have a hand raised, Nicole Rowland, um, please. Hi. Um, hi, thank you. I'm Nicole Rowland with Open Broadband. And I think that it would be good if um, the great grants, instead of it um, putting as so much priority on the fast speeds, if it also considered the um, how quick the customers could be turned up so that there could be funds that would be awarded for people who could get customers turned up in like the first year and stuff, um, even if the speeds may not be as fast as the ones that, I just think that that would be something to consider because people are always saying, I, I don't have any service now, you know, and they're not going to wait. <laughs> I want to open it up. Uh, we have Stacy Hughes in the room. She's an impact officer with Dogwood. Uh, Stacy, can you offer insights on, on how Dogwood is working in the space and, and what's coming next? 
Yeah, um, not sure what's coming next yet. We are, we are fairly new philanthropy and organization. So we're building out our strategies. Broadband is definitely within those strategies. We think we're going to have it align with um, our housing strategy. So hopefully, you know, any new housing that we're involved in um, will ensure that that broadband is part of those developments. Um, we've funded, Dr. Mims mentioned in the beginning what we funded in the past. I think we'll continue to look for those projects that, um, as I like to say, kind of thread the needle um, for projects that we can fund. Um, we do have to fund things that at the end of the day are a charitable purpose. We do have to fund things that relieve government burden. Um, we can't, for example, fund last mile if at the end of the day, charter or, or another for-profit entity will benefit from that. So a lot of these, um, grant requests that come to us, we have to scrutinize fairly heavily. Um, so I, we, we will have, um, and we're working on the process right now, but we'll have an open opportunity for folks through our website to apply for grants. We will look at every single one and see what we can fund. Um, and we truly invite and welcome all ideas and all partnerships that, um, that wanna come in I'm happy to engage with, with anyone uh, to see if we can't help um, with your project or effort. Uh, so going through the Dogwood website is the best way to get in touch? Yeah, not just yet. <laughs> so, um, like I said, we're, we're, we're kind of building the plane while we're flying it. So um, just come directly to me. Um, I'll put in my email in the chat and happy to, to engage with anybody. And once that's ready, I'll send it out to folks. I saw some hands raised from Chris and Mike. Uh, Mike, you wanna go ahead first? Sure, uh, let me first introduce myself to some of the folks who may not know me. I'm with Charter Spectrum and I kind of do the government affairs work for Western North Carolina. I've worked with Jeff and Bill and, and Stag and a lot of folks over the past few years. Um, I wanted to put a fine point on a little bit of what Arthur was talking about with the ARDOF grants. And in just Western North Carolina with the ARDOF awards that we received, we're gonna be servicing over 36,000 people and we're getting over $48 million in funding for Western North Carolina. Across the state, we're gonna be uh, providing service to 128,000 customers and then also, um, for 142 million uh, in ARDOF funds. Now that's federal funding. In addition to that, Charter is adding their own private funding on, on top of that. So since that was a, a reverse auction, that was only a portion of it. So that's not covering the entire cost. So this is a significant investment that we're making into rural areas. And we're looking forward to working with additional folks to do this. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to put a fine point on the art off awards that Charter is doing in Western North Carolina. Thanks for that. Uh, Chris, do you have yeah, a question? This, yeah, this is for Jeff. Hey, Jeff, how you doing today? Um, and I'm with Caporium, or used to be Citizens Telephone Company in Transylvania County. You know, in the 2021 tier designations, uh, Transylvania has now received a tier three designation I'm sure you've heard about that maybe. Um, do you ever think about possibly there could be a population component added to the tiers? Because I would live just south of Charlotte here in South Carolina and Mecklenburg County is also a, a tier three, but they have like a million people where Transylvania County has, uh, I'm looking at the 2019 census estimates around 36,000. Has that ever come up in conversation or have you Kind of, I know that's more of a, a legislative thing, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it is a legislative thing. The statute designates um, where the eligible areas will be located for the great grant in any particular yeah. round. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion around that. So a lot of discussion and debate. Um, you know, frankly, uh, we see a problems 
you know, we see infrastructure problems and deficiencies in every county in the state. So we have advocated that um, all counties be eligible. In the special supplementary round, uh, all counties were eligible except for the non-rural uh, or, or, or I should say the urban areas or non-rural areas of the, uh, of the tier three counties. So all of Mecklenburg was pretty much excluded. Um, right. and, and, they, and they used that population um, data from, I, I believe from USDA but, um, but a large parts of Buncombe County, for example, were excluded, the parts around Asheville and those areas, but there were less populated areas like Sandy Mush that were eligible for funding in right. that tier three county, Buncombe's tier three. So, so I think, uh, yes, you're onto something. I think that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a good suggestion. And that's one that we continue to discuss with uh, the folks at the legislature. So well, Chris, that. can I can I jump in here? Just sure. to your point, it's it's a matter that uh, on these tier study commissions, nobody gets it exactly right. And so the right. thing is, what Jeff wants to do is allow you to include it as a consideration, but it not exclude anybody. Right. But your your legislative delegation is hard at work because they're mad as hell about this. So they're. Huh. Where are you located, Daniel? I'm, I'm located in Raleigh, but I used to do this for a living. You know, I used to work with right. commerce on the tier system. Okay. Yeah. And, and in Transylvania, like everyone else now, like I said, I'm, I'm in the regulatory department. I'm at our headquarters of South of Charlotte, but we have a lot of mountainous, rugged terrain, like most of you, I'm sure that without these grant funding, we'll, we, if it wasn't for that supplemental round of great, those, uh, those people never would get, or it would be very difficult to, to be able to afford to, uh, to get them broadband. And so, I mean, we got 2.8 million and we kicked in roughly right at five four and a half million just to get to, I think, a thousand locations, roughly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. thank you. Bill's got a question for Mike from. I do, for Mike Tank. Uh, one of the questions that we get hit up all the time with is from citizen groups that may have five homes in an area and want to have get access to, and Charter is, of course, the biggest uh, provider around the area. And I think you have a community support group or something that can help local sub communities and stuff get organized. Can you talk to us about how Charter goes about helping little pockets of neighborhoods that uh, might want access? Well, I think there's two ways to look at that, Bill. And uh, Bill, first of all, congratulations on putting such a great uh, program together. I know you spearheaded this and uh, we've worked together a lot. So congratulations on doing this to, uh, very well today. Oh, uh, that, the credit goes to Sarah Nichols and all the technology and a charter because right before this program went on, I got a message that my internet service was intermittent and I'm a charter subscriber, but then it started working great once Brian uh, got on the line. So uh, thanks for your work and service. Absolutely. Um, but to address your question, I think there's two ways that we can do that, that we work with folks. One is what you were talking about is what we call our community solutions group. And this is something that could go work with like a homeowners association, HOA, that can go in and do a pocket with them. So there could be some, uh, do it on a bulk basis to a group that would uh, afford a way to capitalize it over a longer period of time under a contract. Uh, there potentially could be some capital contribution from the HOA to reach out to that that, that pocket of homes. So there is a way to do that. The other aspect and, and to help people understand that many times for the end of line to go when somebody's saying, oh, they're only 100 feet away or they're 500 feet away. The problem is that that line was already built to the end of its opportunity. Uh, the analogy I use a lot of times is like a water line. You can only extend a water line so far because the pressure goes down and then to kick it up to make it forward to, to provide the proper level of service, we have to go back and build a ways back and then move it forward, whether a new node, a new power supply or whatever. So many times that's what that caused uh, an expense to reach that next end of line. Now for funding that, that might be something that uh, Jeff, through the great grant, we can talk about smaller pockets in that area. I know we work with you a lot on the great grant program, uh, but that may be a way just to kind of get a, rather than this one section, maybe that can be a pool of funds to be able to do uh, uh, 
a handful of these pockets or something. Yeah, Mike, I think um, that's a good idea. I think it's Vermont that actually has what they call a line extension program. It's a separate grant program that allows the uh, internet service providers to come in. And when they face a situation exactly like you just described, and like we see all over the state, that's like one of the biggest issues uh, that we see that there's two homes at the end of a line. Um, but this particular program of rot would actually allow a subsidy to reduce those funds. So if you came in and said, well, listen, it's going to be $3,000 because of the equipment and the, and, and the labor and everything, uh, the, you could apply for, uh, to the state for some subsidy that would reduce the cost of that $3,000 cost for those homeowners. So I, yeah, I, I agree. I think there's an opportunity for, uh, for the state to, to lead on that. That, that sounds really encouraging. Uh, is there a way to kind of get that ball rolling with this next uh, funding level? Well, I know that we've discussed it internally, um, uh, but but it just you know I, I think it will depend on what the the House and Senate and the governor's budget do, um, and, and and there might be some opportunities or rooms. I know folks are, are looking at ideas across the spectrum, and we've pitched that. Dan can see that that gets passed, right, Dan, in the legislature? Well, we're all working and hoping and praying. Mike, I was wondering if I could follow up on a conversation that was happening early in the session about RDOF. Paul Desai laid out how the, the funding announcements that just happened in December at the end of the year 2020 um, there's there's six years of lag between when those uh, services need to be deployed and set up. Can you talk about uh, Charter's commitment to following through on those uh, RDOF funds in Western North Carolina? Sure. Um, through the process, I guess I need to back up just a step to make sure that everybody understands how the process worked. It was done through a, uh, a blind bid type of a thing. Uh, and so when we were bidding on these, we did it very quietly, very, uh, and it was a very controlled way of doing it. So we did some things and made some assumptions, but in doing that, we won quite a bit of areas. If you go through the FCC maps, you'll see uh, generally in green, the areas that we won. So for those areas, what we, what our next step is, Brian was earlier talking about the organization we're hiring over 2,000 new people and we're structuring that. Our next step is going to be doing a walkout of trying to go out and do the mapping because we haven't walked all these areas out. We did some assumptions through GIS in doing this bidding process. So now that we have, the, well, the next step will be doing the walkout. We'll have to go out and get pole attachments agreements. We'll have to get ready to make ready. We have to do the design work. So there's gonna be a lot of steps that are gonna be taking place where people are going to not necessarily see lines being strung on the poles right now, but it's going to take a little bit of time. So to answer your question, yes, this is a six-year build-out. And I talked about earlier that uh, from a, a statewide standpoint, we're going to be hooking up over 128,000 uh, people to do this. We have to, um, and I can't remember who, which speaker it was, I think it was Paul, talking about that uh, we have to have 40% of it done within the first three years, and then there's milestones after that. We are going to be meeting that, and but the first year is really going to be doing a lot of the organization, doing the walkout, doing the, uh, the design, getting make ready working, and, and try to figure out the game plan to do the rollout. So we're going to be doing that, and we want to do it as quickly as possible, but we have to do it as intelligently as possible as well. And so the areas that will be going first are places where it's going to be clean running, where there's going to be very little make ready, very little pole work necessary, where, um, where we can get the, the, the job done quicker. The areas that um, where we don't necessarily have a relationship with the power company, we have to get a new uh, pole attachment agreement. Maybe some of the areas where we have to get rights of ways. Uh, other factors that could fall into that. Um, are, are just a lot of those type of, of things to speed it up. So 
Where we do this first is where it's going to be the easiest to get it done. After that, uh, we're going to do it. But we're going to meet all of our commitments, and we're committed to get this done over six years. We certainly want to get it done faster than that, but we're going to do the best we can. We're starting an entire team to do that. So yes, we're going to move forward. And as uh, uh, some other folks talked about, potentially Art Off 2 coming down the road, we certainly want to blend that into the mix of that. Further great grants, we want to do that. So even though that we're talking about Art Off, I think that you can, th you can see the commitment that we're making to rural uh, broadband. If we can blend some of this together, so much the better. Hey, Mike, I have a question that may may or may not be easy to answer, but how how does Charter and Starlink SpaceX, how do you guys coordinate or is there any coordination? Um, how does that work? Who gets to decide, you know, what what geographic area Charter is going to cover and, and which uh, Starlink is going to cover? We are completely independent operations there, and we don't necessarily talk to each other about that. And especially if you look at like RDOF maps, that was all blind bidding. Um, it was a reverse auction. We just, and, and the FCC was very emphatic that there was no communication between companies. They didn't want any type of collusion or even the appearance of collusion. So it was very, very quiet and we had to do it independent of each other. So the way it came out is just completely independent. And it's very much the same way between cable operators. Um, as Stag said, uh, he was showing earlier his age. Uh, I've been in the cable industry over 40 years and I've seen the way the industry has grown uh, by the population growth and this, the way the cable companies have uh, <clears throat> gotten territories. It's been bought and sold and traded to get a larger mass of footprint. And so that's really kind of the way the whole thing is going. Um, different companies have grown in different ways, but directly to your question, do we work with Starlink and try to figure out, oh, you have this area and we have that? No, we do not. I have a, a question in the time I have left here. I'm, I'm gonna wake Nathan up there and, and call on Nathan to uh, uh, jump in on this thing. Uh, we've been thinking about public-private partnerships Funding is a huge issue, but local governments are really hard strapped for cash. Regional agencies such as yours don't have funding streams to work on broadband. What's going to be needed to help local governments and regional governments to move broadband forward in the future? Um, well, Bill, I, th I think a lot of it has to do with staff capacity, and I think that's one role the, the COGS on a regional basis can, uh, can address. And uh, uh, that's certainly true with us and Southwestern Commission and our other COGS to the point that was discussed earlier. Um, you know, we can do a lot of planning and data collecting. Uh, we can make our, our region broadband ready to make it more uh, likely for companies to invest here. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, there's a gap between the resources that are required in the, uh, the, uh, to connect everyone, especially if we want to go to you know, fiber to the home for most everyone. So I'll, I'll defer to Erica for more detail, but uh, I, I, I do think in a more regional collaborative way, that's the really, really powerful part of this summit and the work that y'all are doing with WNC Broadband, because this really does across uh, municipal boundaries, county boundaries. And, and I don't think we can solve it, um, you know, one jurisdiction at a time. Erica? I agree. I think um, a lot of folks on the call know that we've been doing this work for, uh, I've lost track now, six or seven years, maybe, maybe much longer. Um, and our role, I think as Nathan, Point out is really to try to coordinate and see how we can lower the barriers or move some of those barriers for folks uh, to come in. There, is, there are some legislative uh, barriers for local governments to do some of this work. So that's where we've tried to uh, bridge that gap and really see what providers need 
in order to um, make it more cost effective for them. And that's where we've tried to focus a lot of our efforts. And as we work now in digital inclusion and trying to connect people uh, of all backgrounds and, and socioeconomic uh, levels, that's something that we uh, are trying to focus on is how we can continue to fund some of the coordination efforts. And um, I see it as more critical than ever. So we're still having that conversation and if um, we're wel we welcome that feedback from folks too. Well, this is a little commercial, I think, but uh, it seems like Land of Sky and Southwest Commission and local governments generally have a really a fiscal challenge because this is not a public uh, good. It's not a utility, it's a private good. And yet the public demands it and yet you don't have any funding streams. And so what, as I understand, Land of Sky has funded the staff assistance and this whole thing out of grants and other sources. Local governments don't have the resources to put people onto the job. Uh, and so as we think about funding, uh, I think we need to think creatively about getting some ongoing regular funding for you guys, Land of Sky, the Southwest Commission, and maybe local governments to work on the mapping and other issues related to broadband. So uh, that's just kind of a current crusade that I'm on and, and I want to make your life easier, Erica, you know, uh, with all that. Thank you, Bill. I, I, uh, I appreciate that. Erica and I are looking forward to the end of the pandemic because every six months or so I'd buy her lunch at a Mexican restaurant. And, uh, we haven't been able to do that. So uh, we'll get back into that. So I'll be quiet. I'll just jump in. My name is Meg White. I'm a senior program officer with WNC Bridge Foundation. And as a new funder to Western North Carolina, we, we provide about $6 million in grants. Um, and in our third year, we can, where we're focusing on elder care, youth development, and um, wellness support, we continue to see throughout the region uh, requests for nonprofits to do their work and reach more people, whether it be telehealth or teleeducation. So I can't promise anything, but any conversation in regards to helping the broader purpose of those folks who can uh, help uh, the, um, the, um, the implementation of uh, broadband. So we can support the nonprofits who can do their work. Um, you know, we'd, we'd, be, we'd like to be a part of that conversation. Thanks, Meg. I think um, something that I've, we've been talking with some partners about it, this, the COVID, the pandemic has really kind of forced some, in a good way, some really good partnerships uh, with folks and foundations that we haven't worked with in the past. You know, a lot of our work's with local governments and providers. And now we see some of the faith-based institutions, um, telehealth, the work that, that Jeff and uh, the Rural Health Division is working on with the um, telehealth providers. And different opportunities like that have come up and, and um, some of the work that VIA is doing with mental health practitioners as well. So it's, we see those kind of bridges as, as um, being really critical for our Western region in particular. We've got about five minutes to go in this uh, small group session. I was wondering, um, does anyone have any last questions or anything they'd like to share about the work that they're doing in the space? Paula had one note from earlier and Arthur, I may have missed it in your presentation, but um, we did have two new great grant, I'm saying all of this correctly, great grant recipients in the West with Comporium in Transylvania and French Broad EMC in um, the upper part of Buncombe counties uh, with those supplemental funds, kind of going back to what Chris was saying about the tiers. And I just wanted to, to kind of recognize you all for that work. So I know it's a, it was a, a lot of work to, to put those together. Thank you. Yeah, it was, but it was worth it. 
In the short time that we have left, Nicole, would you be willing to talk a little bit about your organization and your involvement in broadband? And you're one of the two outer space guests that we have along with uh, Hunter. So um, would you be willing to do that? Sure, and we've also got um, Jeff Lloyd on here from Open Broadband as well. Um, he's not got his camera on, but, and sorry, I had my phone out earlier. I was responding to a support call, but um, yeah, so um, Open Broadband um, provides service primarily to um, rural North Carolina. We um, have um, service in Alexander County. Uh, we pr provide also a lot of um, public Wi-Fi zones for like downtown Wi-Fi. We are setting up one right now in Hot Springs. Um, and we have many others throughout the state, um, including I live in Mount Holly, North Carolina, and we've got one in Mount Holly, and we've got one in Belmont, which is right next to me. Then in the larger towns, which would probably also apply in Asheville, we um, provide a lot of the gigabit service for co-working spaces, um, which is really helpful at innovation sites. And we have found that this year, we've been working a lot more with churches to get them set up to provide Wi-Fi zones in their parking lots and um, as well as providing service for them. So um, Jeff, is there anything you wanna add? I know we don't have a lot of time before we are out of here. So. No, I think you, sorry, I think I was muted. Can everybody hear me now? All right, perfect. Um, no, I think you covered most of it. I mean, it's just, we are a, a wireless broadband um, WISP, obviously, that we provide several different options. And um, I know Kent's mentioned a couple of times in the chat, the CBRS LTE option, um, which is a newer technology that will be, you know, we can get through the trees. We don't have to do just line of sight. So I think that was a point, an important thing to note that um, Kent tried to, uh, to point out multiple times in the chat, um, but it looks like we've got about 50 seconds to go. So I'll stop there. Uh, Comporium is active in the space, and I'd just like to uh, offer Chris a minute or two to offer uh, what Comporium has going on in Transylvania County. We're yeah, going to be um, kicked, we're going to be kicked back to the regular session. I see Mac Pearsall is on this group. Mac, thanks for joining us today. He was one of the original uh, starters of this. And Mac, did you want to have a ten-second finale? Well, you know, Bill, I was just writing a uh, note on the side to you to express my appreciation to you for your dogged uh, pursuit of this critical part of our infrastructure. And I listened to the technological and to the financial side of it and to the topographic differences and satellites and everything else. I think it's, uh, and, and, and you know, what, how do you future proof it? I applaud the community. Hey everyone, welcome back. Hope that was good for you guys. Um, Bill, you wanna help right. us? Thanks to everybody for hanging in here. When we designed this program, if you recall when we did the last summit at noon, we kind of stopped and said, stay around and have lunch and meet with various people to chat. So that was the format. And to have as many people hang in there for this long, I'm very impressed uh, with your commitment and you all deserve some sort of prize for doing that. We're gonna have a quick report from each of the four groups and then a wrap up. And so let's start first with Arthur Salito, uh, talk about funding. I don't see Arthur uh, signing on. Will we switch to uh, Greg? Okay, oh, I'm here. Oh, there you are, Arthur. Okay, I was sorry. prevented from uh, unmuting myself. <laughs> I talk too much, apparently. So uh, our in our session, we talked about grants from the FCC, the great grants, ARC partnerships uh, between the... Um, HHS and rural health, uh, the uh, internet office, um, and a couple of things to note. Uh, Comporium down in Transylvania County was recently uh, announced a, a grant award um, to help with uh, broadband implementation there. Let's see, we also mentioned uh, 
charter's commitment to uh, following through on RDEF funds. And I believe it was Mike Tank from Charter who mentioned that in addition to the public funding that they're getting, they're also putting a lot of private funds to into these projects. So we're grateful for that. Um, and we ended with um, David Brown, I believe, thanking Bill Cedarberg for his dogged relentlessness in keeping this all going, which is totally true. And uh, grateful for Bill. So yeah. I'm sure I missed a, a bunch, but that, that was- That was an good. excellent report. Although it wasn't Dave, it was uh, Mark, uh, Matt Pearsall who was commentating on that. So, uh, but thanks for the thought anyway. Uh, Greg Vogt, uh, I'm talking yes. about uh, with Paul, continued that conversation. Right. In, in the federal policy group, Paul, thank you very much for joining that group where we had more in-depth co uh, conversation about federal policy. And we talked about the need for more competition from municipal organizations um, involved in order to make sure pricing was uh, lower. We also talked about the difficulty with poll attachment regulation and how it was very expensive for certain providers to get on existing polls and that there, that there was more work that needed to be done in that area. And finally, there was a strong statement that there needs to be more block grants to states to allow states to fund their own programs. In fact, it was a model that the FCC itself used in New York State that was very successful in building out broadband in New York. And that's what we talked about. Great. Sounded, uh, sounds good. And Stag Newman with uh, Walter Johnson. Stag. Stag must have gone to feed his horses or something. We're unmuting him, Bill. Okay. I enjoy giving Stag a hard time, so this is delightful. So unmute Stag. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, first I'd like to thank Walter. We mainly took advantage of Walter's technical expertise to answer a lot of questions. Uh, I think I'd summarize the technology this way is we need an all of the above solution because of the high cost uh, in our mountains because of our granite and our rocks and our beautiful hills and all. So we need deep fiber and then people need high speed tails and those can be fiber to the curb by companies like River Street, French Broad Electric, AT&T or Comporium. Can also be the hybrid fiber coax networks by companies like Spectrum Charter, Morris. Also, I think Comporium has some high speed. And wireless has a very important role to play because some places we just don't have the uh, fixed wired infrastructure. And you know that's a Skyrunner or an open broadband. Uh, there are quite a few other wireless providers in the further Western counties that I, I won't try to name all of them. And cellular has a good role to play, but you really only get the superior cellular performance if you're really close to a cell site. So that means again, more deep fiber, more cell sites. And the way we solve these problems is working together to aggregate demand and come up with enough funding to close the business case. And a lot of that cost is unfortunately not to do with technology. It's civil engineering and permitting and just the nitty gritty hard stuff. Thank you, uh, Stag. And now to Jeff McDerris, a uh, school superintendent on Transylvania County, also a partner with us on the My Future NC and uh, uh, an impressive guy. So Jeff, I haven't talked to you before on this, but uh, welcome and thanks for doing this. Did your group break apart with fistfights on the virtual world or something? Uh, well, we, uh, we're, we're celebrating Dr. Seuss here today, but uh, let me give you some rapid fire uh, takeaways from our meeting, which was great. Uh, first of all, very impressive educators. Uh, so many individuals just, we turned on a dime, quite frankly, and were able to put out some uh, ability to do remote learning pretty quickly. Partnerships are incredibly important. Um, is this has made us all more tech savvy. Uh, it was a monumental effort and continues to be to provide accessibility to some families in areas that are not that far off the beaten path, 
but they just cannot get a signal to them. Uh, there are some places that just cannot be reached. We need more broadband than you think. Uh, my takeaway on that would be like the Atlanta, um, like the Atlanta interstate system years ago when I would go down and watch the Braves. When they built two lanes, they realized they needed four. And uh, I think that we're finding that out increasingly uh, from the conversations that, especially in households where you have multiple students um, and parents that need to be on at the same time. Professional development is critical, cannot be overlooked. Uh, certainly laptops versus desktops. Cybersecurity uh, is something that everyone needs to be thinking about as we broaden our base out there. And we cannot overlook the importance of social emotional contacts with people as they are somewhat out on an island. But I will close by saying the creativity out there is heightened and it's actually very enriching. And I think the uh, really the, the skies, uh, there's no limit. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, unbelievable that we're kind of right on schedule, but I noticed that Mark Hoyt signed on and Mark was with us at the very beginning of this whole process. Mark, I'm gonna ask you for a one minute summary of what you heard and uh, any quick thoughts. We need to unmute Mark. Well, so much for Mark's uh, quick thoughts. Uh, there we go. Hey. Oh, there we go. Okay, right. Mark. Sorry about that. I didn't realize it was locked. Sarah, you locked me out. Um, so I'm impressed at the uh, diversity and the breadth that this uh, group and, and collaboration has gotten to. I remember a much smaller group when we started, uh, mostly city and county folks. And now it's including a huge, uh, enormous group, and it seems to be making great progress. Uh, I want to thank Sarah for her comment about it's not just connectivity anymore. I know there are people not connected. I understand the problems, but there are so many more people that have connectivity and don't know how to use the technology, don't have the education, don't have the pieces that make it useful and make them be able to join the rest of society and do those kind of things. So please focus on that as your next step and help people understand how to use the technology and then help us behind the scenes get the stuff ready so everybody can keep connecting and getting their work done. Great. Thank you, Mark. And finally, to uh, when we organized all this, we were really impressed with comments that Sarah Thompson made. She's done a great job leading the Southwest Commission. And Sarah, why don't you wrap it all up for us and send us on our way? Sure. Thanks, everyone. The planning committee thought maybe we should end this with a call to action, so I'll do my best. Um, this is a regional issue, and um, Sarah Nichols organization, Nathan Ramsey with Land of Sky Regional Council and us with the Southwestern Commission Councils of Government are regional planning organizations. So continue to work with us. We've been working on this issue for years now. Um, let's work together on this. We've done a ton of planning and mapping um, and we're currently promoting the hack out of the state survey so we can get some more accurate maps. Also continue to organize locally, um, work with your providers, be befriend all the experts that are on today's call. Um, let's keep them in our region helping us um, move this issue. Uh, the broadband landscape is constantly shifting and is going to continue to do so. Um, it's a regional, statewide, national issue that's gonna be solved and advanced at the community level. Um, so the solution in one community may not mirror the solution in the neighboring community, and there's a lot of variables at play here. Um, let's continue to advocate, educate your stakeholders, encourage them to advocate. Um, are there funding programs that aren't working? Let's figure out how to get them to work better. Are the FCC maps faulty? Let's fix them. Um, should we be seeing federal funds passed down as block grants? Um, let's advocate for that. And you know, throughout this um, call this morning, I've been thinking that maybe we need a stronger, um, more organization around advocacy on this issue in Western North Carolina. And I think the COGS could really help with that. So thank you all for your continued perseverance on this incredibly important issue. Um, we're living in very interesting times. Technology is changing rapidly and the future of our rural communities, especially our um, sure to be brighter 
if we get high speed broadband out there. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And now it comes the point on the program where all the credits roll at the end. Just a quick thanks for Sarah Nichols, who worked so hard on this. And Sarah does a great job with Land of Sky. We have a couple of students from UNCA, uh, Anitra Griffin and Elias Landsman, who have helped uh, put this all together. Uh, Paul, Zar uh, Paul Moon, also from Land of Sky. Thanks, Paul, for your work. Mark Zarnecki with the website and on the technology side. Thanks to everybody that has participated on this. And uh, I know a lot of you would just like to keep talking broadband, but I'm hungry for lunch and I want to go. <laughs> and end this. So uh, thanks to everybody and we'll be in touch. You've got some great written material that we've sent you. Be sure to read that and, and get it all printed out and distributed all around your neighborhood. So uh, with that, uh, have a great day. And uh, Chancellor Brown, is it okay that we sign off now? I see you're still with us. Uh, keep those catamounts uh, working hard down there. Okay. Bye-bye, y'all. Bye. -bye,